All right, so it's about 10.20 right now, and I am going to get started for the interest of time. I want to make sure that we have um, plenty of time for all of our speakers today, as well as um, question and time to answer a lot of the questions. So this next section of the talk um, is going to be um, about contact dermatitis. So I am going to be speaking to you all today about the prevalence and the impact of allergic contact dermatitis in patients with AD, cases in dilemmas. Like we were brought up earlier this morning, um, contact dermatitis is not something a lot of our AD patients come in thinking about. Contact dermatitis is often an afterthought because a lot of them come in saying, am I allergic to some sort of food I am eating? Am I allergic to something that is in my house? Am I allergic to the mold that's maybe creeping across the ceiling? It's always one of those questions as opposed to what may be more directly related, which is contact dermatitis. Um, one of my jobs um, right now is to do a lot of patch testing. I probably spend about 60% of my clinical time doing patch testing in adults as well as children. So I see plenty of people who come through for atopic dermatitis, get patch tested, have a relevant result, and then improve significantly without the use of a systemic agent. So I'm going to talk to you guys about the co-occurrence of both of those things. So just some of my disclosures here. Um, and the Derm Foundation has supported me. And some of the learning objectives I want to make sure that we cover today before the end of our um, session. I want everyone here to understand the prevalence of allergic contact dermatitis in people with atopic dermatitis. I want to make sure that we also understand what allergens are, um, are most common in allergic contact dermatitis in adults as well as children who have atopic dermatitis. And ultimately, I want to discuss a few of my cases that I've seen that come across my exam rooms that ultimately were diagnosed with allergic contact dermatitis that led to significant improvement even though they had underlying atopic dermatitis. So just a brief overview of allergic contact dermatitis. Now, most of you are intimately familiar with this already, but for those of you that are not, allergic contact dermatitis is a delay-type hypersensitivity. What that means is that this is a reaction that doesn't happen immediately, which makes it really hard for patients as well as providers to pinpoint an exact contact because these reactions may happen days or weeks later. The first thing that happens is something called the sensitization phase, where haptins, for example, these are those um, allergens potentially such as poison ivy that we see a lot in the United States, come in contact with the skin. Langerhans cells or dendritic cells in the epidermis grab these haptins and present them in the lymph node to T cells. Once you teach the T cells this, the T cell remembers this potential allergen, and the next time you come in contact with it, the T cells migrate out of the lymph nodes into the skin, creating the eczematous reaction that we often recognize in allergic contact dermatitis. So in allergic contact dermatitis, you can see a lot of these type of eczematous pink rashes, very t a lot of times very similar to atopic dermatitis, making it excre extremely difficult to differentiate, especially when you have a patient who have a long history of AD and you have a hard time telling whether this is a flare of their AD or if this is a new onset allergic contact dermatitis. So what are some of the top allergens in children? I kind of want to just touch base on this first, is in children, at least, we see several of the top allergens we also see in adults. We see nickel, which is a type of metal. We see cobalt, which is also a type of metal. A lot of these exposures come from jewelry, come from toys, come from metallic objects on clothing. Um, MCIMI, or methyl isothiazolinone, are all preservatives that can potentially be present in a lot of the self-care products a lot of these patients use, including shampoos, conditioners, detergents that you wash your clothing in. And then finally, certain fragrances, especially now, one called hydroperoxides of linalool, which smells a lot like um, jasmine as well as bergamot and lavender. So you'll notice that this list in adults is really not that different from the list in children. And you can also see that methyl isothiazolinone, a preservative, is also on the top of the list here, along with some of the fragrances, fragrance mix one, as, as well as balsam of Peru and nickel. The reason why I'm telling you this is that just to show the fact that kids and adults can get allergic contact dermatitis pretty much to the same exact substances across the board, even though the prevalence of them may differ a little bit. So we shouldn't discount ACD in kids. In one of the studies that looked at several thousand children across the, um, comparing them to adults, you can see that the prevalence of allergic contact dermatitis is about 55.2% in children and 57.3% in adults in a referred population for patch testing. However, on the same note, atopic dermatitis differed quite a bit. Atopic dermatitis was seen in about 40% of children who were referred for patch testing and only 14% of adults who were referred for patch testing, going to show that something that we all intimately understand is that atopic dermatitis is far more present, prevalent in children than it is in adults. So the big question here and kind of the central focus of my talk is can allergic contact dermatitis and atopic dermatitis present at the same time? 
One of the things that we've been taught to think is that allergic contact dermatitis is a Th1 predominant disease, while atopic dermatitis is a Th2 predominant disease. And these are two different ends of a seesaw. So if one side goes up, the other side must come down, and the reverse must be true. Therefore, a lot of the early studies that were focused on allergic contact dermatitis in AD tried to show this thesis. In some of the studies that were done back in the 70s as well as the 80s, they showed that non-atopics developed much stronger reactions to a artificial contactant, dinitrochlorobenzene, which is a strong sensitizer. When they put that on the skin of patients who were non-atopic, they developed a large reaction. When they put it on skin of patients with atopic dermatitis, they showed a smaller reaction. Therefore, the authors in this study concluded that if there is a primary dysfunction in the immune system in atopic eczema, it might be reflected in the altered capacity to generate delayed type hypersensitivity. This paper was published in 1990, and that has largely held true through the next decade. However, looking at real-life atopics, we see that they actually have an increased risk of contact sensitizer to weak or contact sensitization for weak sensitizers. In their previous study, they looked at dinitrochlorobenzene, which is not something that we actually encounter in everyday life, and is not something that people are gonna routinely find on their skin or in personal care products. What we are gonna find are a lot of these potential weaker sensitizers that are gonna be used at a much higher frequency by patients who have skin conditions like atopic dermatitis compared to those with normal skin. In this study here, they found that inflamed skin, such as people who, who um, who do a lot of wet work. So we're thinking about your maintenance um, folks, we're thinking about your healthcare workers, we're thinking about your hospitality workers, we're thinking about your bartenders, or people who have atopic dermatitis had an increased risk of contact sensitization to weaker sensitizers. And furthermore, atopics who have disrupted skin barriers are repeatedly exposed to topical emollients, cleansers, medicaments, and weak, other weak sensitizers that makes it more likely for them to develop these allergic reactions. You can see in this, kind of, um, in this chart here that medium sensitizers, such as topical steroids, different types of rubber accelerators, fragrances, were much higher likelihood to be sensitizers and wet workers, and weak sensitizers like certain types of parabens, propylene glycol, which is an emulsifier that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, as well as different types of fragrances were more common sensitizers in people with a history of atopic dermatitis. So when my patients come in, one of the things I often have them kind of think about is that the culmination of your rashes is like a different layer of cake, right? You have atopic dermatitis. That might make up a big portion of the cake or a small portion of the cake. We don't really know. While allergic contact dermatitis, if that is a condition that you're currently burdened with, could make up a different portion of the cake. By me fixing your allergic contact dermatitis, I might get you much better. I might get you a little bit better if it's present there at all. So having them kind of visualize the importance of this kind of layering system can help them have realistic expectations of what happens when we are trying to diagnose their allergic contact dermatitis. Oops. So when we looked at patients who had eczema or without eczema and they came in for patch testing, what we found was that patients who have eczema probably had more hypersensitivity reactions than patients who don't have eczema. But this data is a little bit controversial. We see that higher rates of allergic contact dermatitis are seen in atopic dermatitis patients in one of the studies done in 2023, so very recently in the United States, looking at healthcare claims data of over 15,000 individuals, about a third of whom had, allerg had atopic dermatitis. They found that that population had higher rates of allergic contact dermatitis to different types of fragrances, surfactants, preservatives, medications, as well as emollients, and they had lower rates of contact dermatitis to metals. But this data is not so clear cut. As a large meta-analysis done in 2017 that included 74 studies, they found that patients that were referred for patch testing pretty much had, was, had similar prevalence of allergic contact dermatitis, whether or not they had atopic dermatitis. But what about children? So one of the things that I do a lot in my clinic is I patch test a lot of children, which is unusual for most practices since a lot of people either don't think that allergic contact dermatitis occurs very often in children or don't have a lot of comfort patch testing children. The youngest kid that I've patch tested probably goes down to about two months of age. So it's certainly possible to elicit positive reactions in even very young children. Some of the prevalence data from the United States have seen that about 20% of kids who have atopic dermatitis might have allergic contact dermatitis. There's a high prevalence of atopic derm in children, which makes it really difficult to tell the difference between whether or not this kid is having an eczema flare or having allergic contact dermatitis 
dermatitis flare. Sometimes kids are harder to patch test because they're obviously smaller. In the average adult, I can probably get on 200, 250 different patches in terms of evaluating for allergic contact dermatitis. In children, my number is much smaller. When I have a really small child, usually about 10 or 20 allergens. When I have a child that's somewhere between six to eight years of age, as you guys can see in these photos, I can easily get on 80 allergens, maybe even more if absolutely necessary. We know that allergic contact dermatitis may coexist with atopic dermatitis. In studies done in, in Italy from two different centers, they found that children who had atopic dermatitis, there was a 36.9% positive patch test reaction in children with AD versus 26.4 without AD. In another study, they saw 19.9% with AD and 11.8% without AD, just going to show that you can certainly develop allergic contact dermatitis regardless if you have atopic dermatitis or not. Um, however, the data is mixed. In another study done at another center in Italy, and it seems like they patch test a lot of children in Italy, which is great, 55.3% of patch test positive in kids with AD versus 76.9% patch test positive in kids without AD. So I guess the big question is, does allergic contact dermatitis happen more frequently in kids with AD or not. In a summary of all the studies that were done from that center, they found that you know different centers had different results depending on who was doing the patch testing and when the patch testing was done and what the ages were. However, at the end of the day, we find that kids with AD and kids without AD probably develop allergic contact dermatitis at about the same rate. We also know that stronger atopic dermatitis may be correlated with a higher risk of contact sensitization. In a Dutch cross-sectional study of 100 kids with AD, 30% were positive, 17% were found to be relevant to their skin condition, and metals and ingredients of different topical skincare products were the most relevant. The worse AD you had or the higher your score at, the more likely you were to have more positive reactions, and that is something that we do see in, um, in my clinic as well. In one of the best studies done on atopic dermatitis and kids with allergic contact dermatitis um, uh, by Dr. Sharon Jacob out in California, she looked at kids in a registry who had atopic dermatitis and patch tested all of them. And they looked at different contact sensitizers across the board and saw that certain contact sensitizers were more common in kids with AD. Cocomidal propobetane and number six, for example, is a very common surfactant that is used in a lot of different types of shampoos and conditioners. Wool alcohol, also known as lanolin, is found in a lot of different types of emollients, such as aquaphor. Tixacortol 21 pivolate is a class A hydrocortisone steroid that is used in over-the-counter topical steroids used to treat AD, very commonly found in the United States, as well as different types of plant extracts under the title of parthenolide can be found in a lot of different types of skin soothing agents that may also be um, used in kids who have AD. So pretty much what we can say from this is that atopic dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis can occur together. We know that kids who have atopic dermatitis and adults with atopic dermatitis are more likely to react to weaker sensitizers. And we know that the worse atopic dermatitis you have, the more likely you are to have more reactions when it comes to allergic contact dermatitis. The most common reactions that we see are to personal care or topical medications. AD patients are more likely to have multiple sensitizations compared to non-AD patients. And finally, AD patients are more likely to react to weaker allergens compared to AD patients. So here I'm going to talk about some of the cases that we have um, in kids who have, in kids and adults who have AD, and then how ACD really played a role in their eruption. So for the first case here is a 13-year-old girl who has a lifelong history of flexural atopic dermatitis that's been traditionally well controlled with topical steroids and topical emollients. She developed a new facial rash three months ago that's been a little bit difficult to treat, and topical steroids and calcineurin inhibitors led to some improvement, but she would subsequently reflare, and here's a picture of her face. Patch testing was positive to lanolin alcohol or Amarcol L101, which was found in her topical emollient that she was using, also known as Aquaphor. She was using it on her lower face daily as recommended by another dermatologist and complete avoidance of this led to complete in improvement. So what is lanolin? Now, the American Contact Dermatitis Society puts out a contact allergen of the year every single year. This contact allergen of the year is not an allergen that is the most dangerous. It is not the most prevalent. It is also probably not the most important. But the reason why they put this out there is so we can bring attention to this allergen and then really help educate patients as well as providers for this to be something that is worth talking about. 
Lanolin is a wool wax that's derived from sheep wool. It has a free fatty alcohol component. That is the allergenic portion. And the best test is testing it to Amarcol L101 or lanolin alcohol. Lanolin Allergy is a kind of a unique allergen in that overall it's a weak sensitizer. When you apply lanolin to damaged skin, such as atopic dermatitis, it can react versus when you apply it to normal skin, it tends to not lead to a reaction. Different other conditions, such as stasis dermatitis, leg ulcers, wounds, are more likely to cause reactions to lanolin. So we have to be careful using this in our patients with AD. Case number two is a 52-year-old woman who has a history of atopic dermatitis, asthma, and seasonal allergies. She's been present um, for a 10-year history of conjunctivitis as well as a periorbital rash. She was using different types of eye drops as recommended by her ophthalmologist, and she was also taking oral antihistamines for her symptoms as well. However, things were not getting better, and she continued to have periorbital dermatitis. She was seen for patch testing, and she was found to be allergic to two components of her shampoo called dimethylamidopropylamine as well as a Amidoamine. These are intermediates in the synthesis of cocomidopropylbetaine. She was using Johnson & Johnson's um, no-tear baby shampoo for lid scrub, something a lot of our ophthalmologists often recommend. And then she, that was what was causing her periorbital dermatitis and rapid improvement upon discontinuation use of this type of shampoo. Cocomidopropobetane is a coconut oil-derived surfactant used in a lot of different types of soaps and shampoos. It's gentler than the traditional um, ingredient that you find in a lot of shampoos, also known as so sodium lauryl sulfate, and it was invented by Johnson & Johnson's in the 1970s. It was the ACDS allergen of the year in 2004, and over 50% of shampoos sold at Walmart still have cocomidopropobetane in one of the more recent studies. There's an overall 1.5% positive patch testing rate, but in kids who have atopic dermatitis, 6.3% percent of them were positive. Case number three here is a 13-year-old female with a long-standing history of atopic dermatitis. Over the last two years, her hands started to get much worse. However, the parents were saying they're doing exactly the same thing. They thought maybe it was due to basketball, but she stopped playing that, but it really hasn't led to a lot of improvements overall. Patch testing for her, as you can see, we can put a lot of different um, patches on a child who was about 13 years old, and we found that she was positive to two important preservatives called methyl isothiazolinone as well as methyl chloro isothiazolinone. And we figured out that the reason why she was getting this was because of a very common toy in the United States that kids like to make called slime. If you're not familiar with slime, look it up on YouTube. You're going to find videos that have billions and billions and billions of views because for some reason kids think making this kind of putty is really fun. They use different types of ingredients such as glues, dish detergents, laundry detergents, borax, for example. And a lot of these ingredients overall contain methyl isothiazolinone, such as the glue as well as the detergent, and it can be very irritating to the skin. Here's a screenshot from a video that I found of two kids playing with slime. Guess how many views this had? Over 200 million views. So if you guys are tired of being dermatologists, go and be YouTubers and just make kids videos because you'll probably make a lot of money doing this as well. We got her off of the slime and you can see that her hands cleared up almost immediately. So even though she still had underlying atopic dermatitis, her hands were flaring pretty badly, not because of her AD, but because of contact dermatitis. And this was something that we used, to, or patch testing was something that we used to help her avoid using systemic agents such as, um, such as topical steroids, systemic steroids, or even systemic immunomodulators that are now much more available than it was in the past. Methyl isothiazolinone is a top trending allergen. What this means is that it's one of the most important allergens that we see nowadays. It skyrocketed to the number two most important allergen in the last decade, and I'll show you a graph of this. It was approved for use in the US as well as the European Union in 2005. What that means is prior to that, we weren't using this as a standalone preservative. It's a ubiquitous preservative found in things like shampoos as well as different types of detergents, and is highly, highly sensitizing when it is used on the skin. You can see in this graph here that back in 2009 and 2010, the prevalence of methyl isothiazolinone allergy was pretty low. But over the next decade or so, you can see that the numbers really started to skyrocket to now 2017, 2018, when this data was published. In the United States, as well as Canada, this became one of the most common allergens that we see in people with allergic contact dermatitis. You're going to notice that all these other numbers falling, and this was across the European Union. And the reason for that was because Europe really got behind this and said, well, we see this really skyrocketing 
skyrocketing trends, we need to do something about it. And they started limiting the use of methyl isothiazolinone and Levon products starting in 2013, therefore leading to an overall decreasing trend of contact dermatitis in the European Union, but not so much in the US or in Canada. This is really showing that the importance of publishing data about allergic contact dermatitis can have on cosmetic industry, as well as the importance of rules and regulations on the use of certain contact allergens in the overall trend of allergic contact dermatitis in its population. So case number four here is a six-year-old atopic male who has a history of environmental allergies as well as asthma. He had diffuse atopic dermatitis that got better only with wet wraps as well as oral prednisone. They were moisturizing every day with Aquaphor, using different topical um, steroids as well as bleach baths, as well as topical antibiotics like mupiracin takes Zyrtec as well as Montelukast every single day, however, continued to have significant flare-up of his rash. We patch tested him and we found positive reactions to propylene glycol as well as a very common fragrance substance called hydroperoxides of linalool. Hydroperoxides of linalool is a fragrance that's now one of the top five most common allergens in children, but he was not using any allergens in the house as well as any allergens in or any fragrances in, her, in his personal care products. Propylene glycol, however, is an emulsifier as well as a preservative, and it's used in a lot of different types of medications. So we're thinking beyond just your shampoos, your conditioners, and things like that. We're thinking about things that you are taking supposedly to help your underlying medical condition. And we found that it was present in both of his mometasone ointment as well as his children's cetirazine that he was taking. One of the websites that I find really helpful, at least in the US, is a website called Daily Med. What you can do is you can go on there and you can look at any prescription or over-the-counter medication, and you can get information on their ingredients. And this website really showed me that his mometasone ointment, which is a moderately potent topical steroid used in the United States quite often for atopic dermatitis, contains propylene glycol. Now, most topical steroids and most topical medication preparations do have propylene glycol in them, with the exception of a very few. Most cream forms, as well as lotion forms of topical steroids, all contain propylene glycol as well. Not only that, his his oral antihistamine, his oral cetirizine by the brand name Zyrtec in the US also contains propylene glycol. So a lot of kids who take oral antihistamines in the liquid form, almost all of them contain propylene glycol to some degree, manifesting in as a systemic contact dermatitis that looks like AD flares in this child. So we switched them over from omedazone over to a fluocinolone topical ointment that does not contain propylene glycol. We switched them over from cetirazine over to loratadine chewable um, that does not have propylene glycol. Remember, the chewable is a solid, so it doesn't need the propylene glycol in there as an emulsifier versus the loratadine liquid still had propylene glycol. Overall, he got significant improvement after avoidance of this with only occasional flares, much more typical for his flexural eczema limited to certain areas as opposed to the whole body flares he was experiencing previously. Previously. In case number five here is a 45-year-old male with a history of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. He was started on dupilumab with clearance of the AD from the entire body except the head and neck. For those of us in the room that probably use a lot of dupilumab nowadays, we probably see this in a fair number of patients where they get this head and neck dermatitis that could have various causes. We did a trial of oral itraconazole and topical antifungal cream for this presumed malassezia-induced head and neck dermatitis, but it didn't get much better. Topical steroids were moderately effective. Patch testing showed a positive reaction to desoglucoside that was present in his daily shampoo, and he saw significant improvement over the course of the next two months, outlining the importance of consideration of patch testing for patients who get head and neck dermatitis, even though they are on dupilumab. Now, that kind of brings me to the kind of the next point, which really raises more questions than it does answers here, but I want to propose it anyway. You kind of remember this paradigm here of allergic contact dermatitis being Th1 predominant and atopic dermatitis being Th2 predominant. But now we kind of throw in this elephant in the room, which is dupilumab, and we know that what dupilumab does is it kind of suppresses this Th2 inflammation. So if dupilumab suppresses Th2 inflammation, shouldn't it make allergic contact dermatitis worse if the paradigm is truly the seesaw of Th1 versus Th2? However, in dupilumab, you're going to find many, many, many dozens, if not about 100 studies, seeing that dupilumab has actually benefited patients with allergic contact dermatitis. Just to kind of read out a few here, successful treatment of dupilumab with systemic contact dermatitis following hair dye in a patient with dermatomyositis, dupilumab treatment in two patients with severe ACD caused by sesquiterpene lactones, which are plant-derived allergens, treatment of generalized isoborneoacrylate, which is one of the most common allergens now in diabetic monitoring devices, treatment of that used using dupilumab, dupilumab for refractory allergic contact dermatitis to rubber and latex, 
and then a case series of many dupilumab-treated patients where they had patients who were even nickel allergic to implants, and they got in better using dupilumab. So if the paradigm truly holds that Th1 and Th2 are on opposite, opposite sides of the spectrum, none of these studies should really make sense. But they do occur, and I personally have used dupilumab in patients with allergic contact dermatitis with pretty significant improvement. So I think overall, the paradigm is probably a little bit more complicated than that, and I think further study is really needed to understand how allergic contact dermatitis and AD can truly coexist from the molecular standpoint. So just some take-home points here, um, and before I open it up for questions, allergic contact dermatitis is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction with a high overall prevalence rate in adults as well as children. We know that ACD can occur in adults as well as kids who have atopic dermatitis, and I think they occur at least at the same rate, if not potentially a little bit more, in, um, in, kids who in, in people who have AD compared to those who don't. Atopics are likely to be sensitized to weaker as well as more numerous allergens compared to non-atopic. And I think that makes sense from both the skin barrier disruption perspective, as well as the fact that patients who have atopic dermatitis just use more stuff, right? A lot of us who don't have AD might not moisturize at all versus people who have AD are used to slathering all sorts of stuff on their skin um, that potentially can serve as sensitizers for them in the future. And we always consider patch testing in adults and children who have AD because you never know how much of it is AD and how much of it is allergic contact dermatitis. Conditions can flare unexpectedly, eczema affecting a new location, traditional treatment treatments no longer working, or new or persistent atopic dermatitis or eczematous dermatitis after starting dupilumab, especially on the head and neck, are all reasons why patients should be patch tested, especially if any of those hold true. So I just want to open it up for questions. Thank you all for your attention, and, I'm, and let me know. Thanks. Yes, so in the front here. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Yeah, th thank you for this uh, very nice and, and practical presentation. Um, I, I, as you well know, in the US, I'm from Canada, we have the same issue, depending on where you practice. Uh, patch testing might be easily available, but usually it's more difficult to have access to patch testing. So I, I, uh, I see that on your summary slides, you did not suggest that everybody with atopic dermatitis should be patch tested. Uh, I just want to confirm that this is what, what you think should be yeah. done, uh, one. And two, I was wondering, in, in terms of, uh, of morphology of atopic dermatitis, so you mentioned a number of situations where you suggest that we, we send patients for patch testing. Anything related to morphology, if it's more uh, inflammatory, if it's like oozing, if it's like redder, uh, both in kids and in adults, as we know the morphology is, is different in, in children and adults, are you using this as well? Or it's, it's mostly what you presented on your slide? Yeah. All right. So um, to touch on the first one, yeah, ab absolutely. So I would not say that every atopic patient should get patch testing, but I think atopic patients who are perhaps flaring unexpectedly, getting new locations of involvement, should definitely be patch tested to see if that is potentially related to allergic contact dermatitis. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for that clarification. And the second part about morphology, I found it to be extremely difficult to tell the difference between AD as well as ACD. Um, case in point being mostly hand dermatitis, right? So chronic hand eczema is something that we see a lot affecting the um, livelihoods of a lot of patients who have AD. But it's almost impossible to tell how much of this is just their underlying atopic dermatitis, how much of it could be systemic contact dermatitis, and how much of it could be just topical contact dermatitis to things such as rubber gloves worn during wet work or any of those other contacts. So I think the morphology itself is really difficult. I think perhaps more important to differentiate between the two is maybe location. So if you see a 15-year-old boy who's never had atopic dermatitis before come in and now has what looks like eczema just on his face or just around his eyes, those are kind of signs that I say this is probably ACD over AD versus if I have a kid that comes in and just has atopic dermatitis involving the anacubital fossa, popliteal fossa, back of the neck and wrist, I'm much more likely to tell the parent, you know, probably going to have a low pretest probability for this being atopic, for being, this being allergic contact dermatitis. So I think location for me and maybe chronicity maybe has more to do with just the morphology itself. Uh, any tips or tricks for, pa for an atopic patient who may have involvement on their back that you want to patch test? Is yeah. Is that of a, a recipe? Yeah. So um, 
Other than the back, other locations I like to use, I like to use the thighs, mostly because it's also another relatively flat area that you can put a decent number of patches on. So I will go to the thighs, I'll go to the belly, I'll go to the arms, um, less preferentially. However, if they have kind of a rash all over, two of the things that I really like to do is, one, I like to do prednisone. So I actually do put a lot of these patients on prednisone for several weeks before I do patch test them. So I will usually start them off on a prednisone taper. So I'll start somewhere, so if it's an adult, for example, I'll start at 60 milligrams for a week, 40 milligrams for a week, 20 milligrams for a week. Then I get them to 10 milligrams and I hold them at 10 milligrams for about two weeks and I patch test on that second week. So their immune system is not constantly undergoing flux when we're patch testing them. So I'll bring them back about four weeks later, patch test them at that point and I can still find the relevant positive reaction in many cases. If I have someone who maybe has more chronic atopic dermatitis, doesn't respond to prednisone or doesn't do very well on it, I can certainly do cyclosporin as well, tapering them from five milligrams per kilogram, eventually down to about one or two milligrams per kilogram before I patch test in the same way where I wait for them to have at least a week or two on that dose before I do the patch testing. I do see a lot of patients who get patch tested on dupilumab. There are a lot of studies looking at whether or not dupilumab affects patch testing. In my personal experience, if you still have a rash while you're on dupilumab, and that rash we are thinking is due to allergic contact dermatitis, then presumably the allergen that I am putting on your skin can, introduce, can induce that same exact rash to appear. And therefore, I do patch test on dupilumab without stopping them. Because the several patients I did put on dupilumab that I, did, that I did stop, they all had an angry back reaction, which made it really difficult to read. Great. Thank you guys very much. All right, so for our next speaker, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melinda Gooderham, from, um, who's a dermatologist and medical director at the Skin Center for Dermatology in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. She's an investigator with probity medical research and assistant professor at Queen's University and a consultant physician at the Peterborough Regional Health Center. She is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and she is actively involved in teaching of medical students, residents, med um, nurse practitioners, and physicians with both didactic as well as clinical hands-on training. She practices with a focus on psoriasis, AD, skin cancer, and clinical research, and she contributes to several peer-reviewed dermatology publications as an author as well as a reviewer. And today, she's going to be talking to us about the patient's perspective, a global look at non-atopic patient burdens in atopic dermatitis. Let me get to your presentation. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the great uh, lecture on, on allergic contact dermatitis. So I, if any of you already know me, I'm, I'm actually a clinical researcher. My interest is in new drug development. And so why am I giving a talk on, on the patient's perspective of, of non-atopic burdens? And I think one thing that I have learned uh, as we started to do more research in the area of atopic dermatitis, I've General, I'm a general dermatologist as well, so I've always treated AD patients. Uh, but once you start to work in an, an area and you gain more patients in that area and you start having more frequent visits, you're spending more time with these patients and you're getting to know them better. And I was really learning a lot uh, more about the burden and also finding that we have all these great new treatments that are available and why couldn't I just use these new drugs to, to fix all their problems. And I, at that point, I realized it's not that simple. I need to learn a bit more about uh, the burdens of these patients. So is this, are, does this work or no? No, you gotta use the, okay, perfect. So here are my conflicts um, based pretty much on the research that I do. I've uh, been fortunate enough to be involved in, in the development of many new therapies in the atopic dermatitis space. And so the objectives for this talk, I, I was also part of a program where we learned about the patient perspective that I wanted to share with you. And I'll tell you a bit about that later. Um, but the, the publication is not yet available, so there's a lot of things that you'll have to read when it, when it comes out that I can't talk about today, uh, but I will let you know a bit about the program. So I wanted to review what these non-atopic patient burdens are that exist. 
I also wanted to look at some of the data already that is out there to, to support what we know already about this uh, patient burden and look at some of the future projects that are ongoing or that have been done that are helping us learn a little bit more about the patient perspective so that if we can understand it better, we can hopefully help alleviate uh, some of the burdens that our patients suffer from. So I'm gonna be talking about non-atopic burdens, but to make sure we're on the same page, I wanted to start off with what is the atopic burden. So the, the classic, uh, presentations, the signs and symptoms. You can see the, you know, the Denny Morgan folds, the erythema, the excoriations, the lichenification. You can see the, the skin pain that patients um, suffer from, whether it's from edema, erythema, the skin fissuring, the pruritus that we've already heard so much about this morning already and the impact that the pruritus has as the, the hallmark of this condition. There's also the visibility of the disease uh, that if you have atopic dermatitis, sometimes it's not easy to hide that um, from, from other people. And then, of course, the chronicity. We can see the signs of chronicity, whether it's through the lichenification, sometimes scarring of the patient, or even signs of um, steroid therapy over years, patients with striae or uh, thinning of the skin from long-term use. All of these sort of chronic factors are what our patients live with. And then of course the infections that they have to deal with. So on top of their atopic dermatitis, they're constantly um, dealing with infections, worried about infections, worried about catching uh, things. So those to me are the atopic things. But what I wanna focus on today, when we have a patient in front of us, what is it that we're not seeing that we really need to think about uh, when we're having the discussion with our patient, when we're trying to engage in shared decision making, what are the things that we, that we need to uh, ask about and think about? So there are a number of very complex, we've heard about some of them already today, uh, the sleep deprivation, the out-of-pocket costs that uh, patients uh, have to deal with, the burden of treatment, putting on a topical agent uh, every day, one that they might become sensitized to because they're applying it to, to broken skin the negative impact on their relationships, whether it's at home, at work, at school, their overall reduced daily functioning, the bullying that they might uh, have at school or discrimination at work. We heard an excellent uh, deep dive into the, uh, the anxiety and depression and mental health burden in this population, the impact on the whole family, uh, and those are the things I wanted to, to take a look at today. So although I'm going to look at a global perspective, I am from Canada, and so is uh, Dr. Bissonnette. So we'll start off with some Canadian uh, stats. The Eczema Society of Canada has done a number of surveys of Canadian adults and children with AD. They have a, a good proportion of patients with moderate to severe dis uh, disease. They've looked at quality of life. They've looked at itch and some patient insights in, in mild to moderate patients. So I'll throw in a bit of that data along with some other global um, information. So we heard a lot about this morning earlier about the lack of sleep in this population, the fatigue that they suffer. In Canada, 79% of patients with moderate to severe disease reported interrupted or loss of sleep. And if you looked at the percentage of adult respondents who reported being woken up every single night due to itch, it was one in five patients with moderate disease and one in two or every other patient with severe disease is being woken up every single night due to itch. There's the multiple failed treatments that they've used over the years. So in Canada, 43% of patients reported using 10 or more medications to manage their AD, and 29% reported 15 or more medications. So what is it that the patient's gonna think when they come to see you for the first time? that your number 16 medication is gonna be the magic uh, bullet for them. They lose a lot of hope with what's coming next in, in what treatment options you are going to give them, that you're, you may just be prescribing another cream like the last dermatologist. So these are the things we have to think about. You know, Even when you're writing a prescription, this may be the 16th or 17th or 18th treatment you're giving this person and it might require a bit more of a discussion or explanation. 
There are also the costs of all of those treatments, um, the out-of-pocket costs. There's been a, a few publications, so one from France that looked at the out-of-pocket cost based on severity. So you can see a jump from the mild patients to the more moderate severe. So moderate AD, the average out-of-pocket cost per year was almost 250 euros. For severe AD, that went up to 462 euros. Similar uh, re results from Germany, looking over uh, the patients with moderate severe AD was 360 euros per year. In the, the chart here is looking at the proportion of patients and what are they spending their money on. So again, a, a quite a jump from the mild to the moderate patient and very similar uh, results between the moderate patient and the severe patient. Mostly they're spending their money on emollients and hygiene products but also solar protection and things like dressings and bandages. Those, they can be quite expensive, as well as specialized clothing. Maybe it's cotton or seamless clothing, or maybe there's uh, silver threads for uh, reduced infection risk. But these items are often quite expensive. And then there's the dietary supplements. Always trying to find that one uh, you know, immune booster uh, vitamin and spending, again, quite a bit of their money on, on some of these treatments, and some of them may be helpful, but others may be unstudied. The physical activity avoidance. We heard earlier about the impact of obesity on um, atopic dermatitis. In Canada, 47% of patients avoided, uh, reported avoiding physical activity because of the impact of heat and sweat and flaring of their disease, as well as uh, being embarrassed to go to the gym uh, during a flare-up, and the fatigue of just not having the energy to get up and go. So there is uh, impaired work performance and missed opportunities at work. This one was a surprising one to me. The average reported missed days of work per month were 2.4. So not only is there a loss of wages associated with that, but somebody at work has to pick up the slack, take over, and that can cause uh, friction between employees in a workplace or, or friction between the employee and the manager as somebody else has to make up for that uh, missed time. But this is the one uh, that always gets me. It's the missed important events. 32% reported missing important life events. Maybe it's your own uh, graduation or uh, your child's ballet recital. But these are things that you can't make up with time. And if that's a flare that's going to keep you from living your best life, we need to do what we can to make sure that we can help prevent these flares so that they don't have to miss important things. This leads into the family impact. We see this in practice all of the time. It could be one of the parents that has atopic dermatitis and is affecting the, the family dynamics or the relationship or perhaps it's the child with atopic dermatitis and the parents don't agree on the treatment plan. One may be wanting to put on the topical steroids as prescribed, the other who's read horrible things on the internet about topical steroids and will not allow the application. And sad to say that I have seen many uh, families in my own practice over the years end up in divorce, which will then make treatment more difficult because you know, this weekend was spent at one parent's house and they didn't have the cream and, oh, look at, you know, my child is flaring because her father didn't put the cream on like he was supposed to and now I have to deal with the flare. All of this discussion is unfortunately taking place in front of the child. So you can imagine how, um, what impact that would have. This was um, an interesting poster uh, presented at the RAD conference in December 2021. It was a global web-based survey on 366 patients from 32, uh, 366 individuals from 32 countries, and they filled out the 27-item questionnaire from the major life-changing decisions profile. And so what they were asked is, how much does uh, your eczema influence all of these different factors? So the most obvious, you know, top three that uh, eczema influenced buying different clothing, bedding, and other household products, changing the family eating habits. You know, we also heard a lot about that earlier too, about this must be related to the food, so we can't have this food in the house. So not only is the child's diet changing, but the whole family's diet is changing. It also affects whether they have a pet. Uh, other things on the home, such as 
what, uh, you know, are they going to have carpeting? Are they going to, how are they going to design the home? About going to school, there are uh, patients who are now being homeschooled or switching their school. Parents are changing their jobs or they're taking a leave of absence from work to care for their child. Uh, they are, um, they're leaving their post-secondary education early so that they can again focus on the family. But all of these sometimes come along with some resentment and some guilt, uh, again, that we heard about earlier. I think the one thing that also wanted to point out, although it's the lowest category, about 25% of respondents had some influence, but uh, getting a divorce and separation or not having any further children. This does happen. I've seen it in my own practice. And I, you know, I think if we have such great treatments available now, some approved for ages down as young as six months of age, I'm hoping that we'll be able to understand our patients better get them on the right therapy so that these uh, family impacts and decisions don't have to uh, occur. So there was a nice article uh, by Dr. John Koo looking at how atopic dermatitis affects the family. Again, affecting the child behavior, the relationship between the parent and the child, uh, the relationship between the parents, but also the negative impact on other sibling relationships. So often more time is being spent uh, with the child who has the atopic dermatitis, and there is, again, a negative impact on some of the other children in the family uh, because of this. There are the parental sleep disturbances that we just heard about, uh, which, again, affects the stress and anxiety and relationships at home. There's the diet and meal prep and the overall home environment with the financial burden of these extra treatments. So all of these things, again, that we don't immediately see when we're assessing our patient and doing our easy score, even when we're asking an itch NRS and you know, patting ourselves on the back for remembering to do a full assessment. There's all of these other things going on at home that we really need to think about. And the child may have this going on at home and go to school. At school, there is the stigmatization. There's what we just heard about the self-stigmatization as well and the bullying. So there doesn't seem to be a, a safe place for these kids sometimes. They really go from, from one uh, stressful situation to another. So this was an interesting review by Pavel Chernyshov, uh, published a couple of years ago, looking at the stigmatization and self-perception in children with AD, looking at the CDLQI uh, scores. But the one I wanted to highlight here was how much trouble have you had because of your skin with other people calling you names, teasing, bullying, asking questions, or avoiding you. And there was quite a range in responses, the lowest you know, on the Likert scale from zero to three. The lowest was 0.16 from Turkey, but as high as 2.2 out of three in Iran. And so you can see how many different countries were looked at, Singapore, Czech, Italy, Ukraine, UK, Malaysia, Sweden, and Korea. But there's quite a range there with some quite high scores of children who are feeling uh, bullied, teased, and have their friends avoiding them or their, their schoolmates. There's the mental health burden that we just heard, of, uh, really an excellent lecture, so I'm only going to mention this uh, briefly, but in, in this Canadian cohort of 88% of patients with mild, moderate to severe uh, atopic dermatitis, two-thirds reported uh, anxiety and 44% of patients reported being depressed. The uh, impact of itch on mental health, so in patients with moderate disease, 45% felt that their itch was negatively impacting their mental health, and 71% uh, with severe disease reported an impact on their mental health from the itch. The itch is also adding to the overall stress, even in the mild patients. More than half of patients with mild AD were uh, reporting stress from the itch, two-thirds of the moderate population and almost 90% of patients with severe AD were dealing, um, feeling that the itch was affecting them. So this was an, another uh, publication from Jonathan Silverberg looking at depression and psychological distress in adults in the United States with AD. So this was an analysis of uh, medical expenditure panel surveys from 2004 to, to 2015. And so they looked at the PHQ-2, which are the two questions, you know, are you feeling down and depressed or have you stopped doing things you enjoy? And then the Kessler-6 index, which looks at psychological distress. So this looks at things like hopelessness, restlessness, apathy, 
Uh, so there's six um, factors that they look at. And when you look at the PHQ-2 results, AD was associated with increased odds of screening positive, so 44% versus 22%, so twice as likely to uh, test positive on the PHQ-2. But if you look here at the AD patients in this um, Kessler six item, the psychological distress, so looking at the things like hopelessness and restlessness, uh, the AD patients actually scored as high as patients with the primary diagnosis of anxiety and depression, and much higher than the healthy controls, even patients with psoriasis and urticaria and asthma. So the AD patients really do have the same psychological distress as uh, patients with, with mental uh, diagnosis of anxiety and depression. And since we are uh, talking about this from a global perspective, we have to think of the burden of AD in skin of color. So we know that black children are at six times greater risk for severe AD than white children. A uh, problem is that the scoring systems that rely on erythema can underestimate the severity of AD in the darker skin tones. That might lead to a, a delay in diagnosis, a delay in treatment, uh, or an underdiagnosis. Uh, there was a report showing the clinician and patient reported severity of AD showed a weaker correlation in patients with darker skin tones compared to uh, white patients. And AD can lead to a greater negative impact on quality of life because of this underestimation. Also, in, you know, from the Canadian data, we have found a disproportional level of mental health problems in the one-year prevalence of atopic dermatitis in our Indigenous population who are living on a First Nations Reserve. This was hi uh, higher than the other population, could be as high as 16.5% for one year. Uh, there's often, a, in remote areas, there is a lack of resources to deal with mental health, uh, and this is hopefully something we, we can put more resources in to, uh, to deal with this. So how are we gonna explore this patient burden? This was really the, mostly the focus on, we know that there is a burden, what can we understand about this burden and what can we do to learn more? Well, there was a recent publication um, earlier this year from the Netherlands at the Erasmus uh, Medical Center where they did a qualitative uh, assessment of 20 patients. So they had them in three different, fo three different focus groups and then these sessions were transcribed verbatim and analyzed using several phases of coding to create an overview of the patient's needs and preferences. So it's asking the patients, you know, what do you need from us? What can we do uh, to reduce your burden? And so based on these 20 uh, responses, they came up with a number of sort of solutions based on these three buckets. So consultations with physicians, the organization of AD care, and then the therapeutic uh, decision-making process. So starting with consultations with, phys with physicians, the these patients felt a need for better recognition of not only the physical impact of atopic dermatitis from their, from their doctors, but also the emotional impact. They really felt that the, the physicians were not uh, understanding the emotional impact of their disease. They also felt a need for the increased role of patients in determining the disease impact. So things like patient reported outcomes so that they can um, express how this is affecting them. So patients appreciated that opportunity to, uh, to give this information. They also wanted a more personal approach. They wanted better communication uh, with their doctors, which they felt was essential for a good doctor-patient relationship. And I know dermatology all over the world is underserviced and we all have uh, short visit times and this is always a challenge that I think we need to come up with better ways so that we can form better relationships with our patients um, even though we are often limited by time. The organize, organization of AD care, they wanted in addition to the medical supportive care, they also wanted psychosocial uh, supportive care from their clinicians. And another interesting thing was the need for quick access to healthcare when they're having a flare. How many times do you go into the room to see a patient and they say, oh, you should have seen me last week when I called to book this appointment. I was really suffering and now I don't look that bad. And they, then they feel like a fraud that, you know, they were booking this appointment when they didn't really need it. So I really, uh, you know, after reading this paper, I have really tried to uh, impress on my staff that, you know, if our patient with AD calls and they're having a, fla a flare, please fit them in. Whether it's at lunchtime or the end of the day, we need to see them 
uh, as sooner rather than later so that we can actually help them during the flare and they don't have that feeling of, oh, I wish I was here last week or I wish I was here last month or they're pulling out their phone and they're trying to show you the pictures of how bad it really was. And we all know it's very difficult to photograph uh, AD in a flare to capture how bad it is. So also the therapeutic decision-making process that uh, the patients really wanted um, adequate, understandable, and tailored information. And there's really has been an explosion in new therapies and I've tried to improve the handouts that I'm using in my clinic to sort of there's so many new mechanisms of action to try to explain. Um, I'm trying to do that with some handouts that at least when I'm going through it with the patient, they have something that they can take home with them and review it again and say, oh yeah, this was this medication, this was this medication. So again, something maybe we can work together with industry to develop some better resources to make that shared decision-making process a little bit easier uh, to go over all the new topical therapies, all the new systemic therapies when we're going uh, over their options. The also, um, just the decisive factors for choices within the decision-making process, they wanted to better understand what are their options and help better guide uh, how to make those decisions. But their final thing was that next steps within that AD treatment should be patient dependent. They really felt that they should be the ones making the final decision once we arm them with the information that they need to make that decision. But really their treatment and their treatment decisions should be driven by the patient. So that brings uh, me to Advanced CQP, which is the program that I, I participated in. I was hoping to share more of it with you, but it is going to be published soon. Uh, but I can tell you a, a little bit about it. So it was an expert-led initiative. Although it was uh, funded by Abvi, Abvi didn't have any input. It was really run by the experts. The, the co-chairs were Jonathan Silverberg and Andreas Wallenberg. And really we were given the task of how can we improve the lives of patients with AD, just in general. You know, we started off with a blank slate. What can we do uh, to improve the lives of patients with AD? And we wanted to look at things like their treatment goals, treatment failures, disease severity assessments. How do we decide what patient uh, moves from topical ther therapy to systemic therapy? Sort of the whole, um, the whole spectrum. But we wanted to start off by learning about what the patient wants from us. What, you know, we don't want to just assume all of these things. So there were 88 uh, 45 minute interviews around the world, all in their native language. They were done over the phone. There were one on one patient interview. And they were, patients were asked, what are their most significant symptoms? What is the impact on their daily life? What do they think about the PROs or the scoring methods that they're asked? What do they think about the scoring methods that their doctor is doing, like the EASY and the score ad? Um, what should we include in the, in the patient reported outcomes? Do the ones uh, that we have already, are they good enough or should we be developing new ones? We also wanted to know how are they making their treatment decisions? Because we have these new therapies and you know, sometimes the choice is hearing all of the options and then saying, no, thank you, I will continue doing what I'm doing. So what, what is driving that decision? Uh, are they getting the information that they need to make that decision? And also, what are their expectations of treatment? So all of these were asked um, in, in this interview, and as I mentioned, in their native language. So it really was a global study. The, the largest group of patients was from the United States with 17. But then there were five patients from Brazil, Mexico, Poland, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, China, and Japan. So we really had a nice uh, global selection of patients. And what I found most interesting was the same themes that we heard from country, one country and across the world, the same answers from patients with atopic dermatitis. So there was a lot of similarities. There were some subtle differences in some of the wording that they used. Uh, but overall, uh, things were, were quite similar across the globe. So this is just a, a sneak peek into some of the, the things that we learned before you can read the full publication yourself soon. Uh, but the patients, the 88 patients that were included, there was a, a nice balanced age range. 63% of them were female. Uh, most patients had a high level of education as we were 
reaching closer to the, eight, the 88 patients, we actually had to look for patients without as much education to find more of a balance. So 46% had high school education, 46, another 46% had college uh, or university or higher, and then the rest had uh, neither of those. Based on, so the, the patients were asked questions. Um, they didn't realize they were filling out a poem, but the, the way the questions were based, were um, they were being asked the poem. And based on that, almost like 87.5% had moderate to very severe disease. So these were patients who were uh, suffering with their disease. And also an exclusion, uh, exclusionary criteria was if they were a so-called uh, professional patients. So if they're already part of a patient organization, they, they did not qualify. We just wanted patients who are out there, um, who are not already advocating and, and thinking of these things already. We wanted to sort of get, get their fresh perspective. Some of the things we learned, 75% of patients experiencing the itching, the redness, uh, flaking skin and sleep disturbance every one to three days. Half of patients experienced mental health issues two to three times per month. And the, another half of patients were affected by skin pain uh, two to three times per month. And when looking at what is driving uh, their change in treatment, overwhelming uh, majority of the answers were itch. It's the itch that will drive uh, whether they stay on a therapy or switch to another therapy. Uh, very important um, factor. Other interesting findings, the patients in this survey, just the same as the one in the Netherlands, really felt that clinicians underestimate the burden of their disease. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm finding that out in my own, um, in my own practice and trying to be a better listener. Sometimes I have to like just zip it and sit there and, you know, we're so used to, to having this two-way conversation and, and, and jumping in, but I really have been trying to, to let them tell me about their burden. Uh, the patients, although they appreciate the patient-reported outcomes, they can sometimes find them very hard to understand. They're not exactly sure. Like I remember I had one patient the other day, she takes like a little gummy to help her sleep at night. So she wasn't really sure how to answer the, the sleep because her aid, atopic dermatitis does affect her sleep. That's why she takes a sleeping aid. So does she you know, score it based on how she's taking the aid or if she doesn't take the aid? So just little nuances that sometimes they need a little explanation to help them. And one other interesting uh, factor that, that came up quite a number of times in these interviews was the patients wanted um, their the patient reported outcomes, but they also wanted a clinician reported outcome to balance. They felt that some patients might overestimate their symptoms and then get a better treatment. And that if they were being honest on a day when they were having a good day, they might not be offered the better treatment, quote unquote. So to have both sides, the, the objective and the subjective measures, really were important to patients in uh, looking at therapies. So I just wanted to, so that publication should be coming out very soon uh, with some more details about uh, that program, those 88 global patients, and we're hoping to take that information, come up with uh, some new sort of guidelines, a shared decision-making tool that, that dermatologists around the world can use uh, in their clinics. So just one other thing that I had nothing else to do with, but just to keep uh, open, is the new PRID um, measurement that's being developed uh, by, by GRID, the global group, uh, conceptual framework for a patient-reported impact of dermatologic diseases, which is PRID, which you may have heard of already. It's also a qualitative uh, concept elic elicitation study. They started actually at the last World Congress in Milan, 2019. They had a number of focus groups um, they looked at those uh, respondents' uh, answers. They did a validation exercise. They wanted to do more interviews, but then COVID unfortunately happened. So the next 28 interviews were done um, virtually. And then with that information, this is the, the uh, patients that were included. And I just wanted to highlight here, there were about 17% of the patients had atopic dermatitis. Uh, so this is more not just an AD thing, but a, a global uh, skin disease PRO that would essentially go along with the DLQI or, or be an updated version of the DLQI. And the things they looked at, the physical impact, the psychological impact, social, financial, and the impact on daily life and responsibilities. 
And so they're in phase five right now. So it is uh, being translated into 17 different languages. They will be launching that. And I'm, I'm hoping we're going to learn more about this PRID, this new PRO, hopefully at this meeting. I, I haven't looked yet. But um, I think that will really offer another way for us to understand not just our atopic patients, but all of our patients and understand the burdens uh, for them. So just to finalize here, there are many, many invisible burdens in atopic dermatitis that I think we don't always consider when we're having that discussion, when we're doing our easy score and when we're offering different therapies, things that we have to, um, that we have to think about, such as the costs of their, their out-of-pocket out of costs, the impact on their family, sleep, et cetera. There are multiple studies showing this is, these burdens are uh, all global. There are patients in all countries that suffer with the same. There may be a disproportionate uh, burden in some patients with darker skin tones uh, because of an underestimation of their disease. And some future projects that have been done and that are ongoing hopefully will help us better understand the patients and will improve our uh, shared decision-making uh, abilities. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that very informative talk. Um, I want to open it up to one question. Um, if, since we are since we are a little pressed for time. Great. Thank you so much. All right, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Ko, um, who is a dermatologist, pediatric dermatologist, and dermatopathologist here in Singapore. He's the head and senior consultant of the Department of Dermatology at KK Women's and Children's Hospital and a visiting consultant at Singapore General Hospital, St. Kang General Hospital, and the National Cancer Center. Dr. Ko is a clinical associate professor at the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School Program, adjunct associate professor at NTU LKC Medical School, and a senior clinical lecturer at the NUSYLL Medical School. He serves as the Secretary General of the Asian Society of Pediatric Dermatology and Treasurer of the International Society of Pediatric Dermatology, and he is here to talk to us about digital technologies as adjuncts in the diagnosis and treatment of atopic dermatitis. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for that very kind introduction, and I would like to welcome everyone to Singapore. I do apologize for our weather. For those of you who have eczema, uh, I apologize if it's flaring now. <laughs> uh, we do have the El Nino effect coming on, so uh, I do apologize. It's been quite good over the last uh, few days. We had a little bit of rain, but if you were here two weeks ago, we went up to 35, 36 degrees, and it's humid as well. So uh, I saw uh, radius in shorts. If uh, you can come in shorts, that's, that's great as well. Okay, so... Um, so besides my full-time job as a pediatric dermatologist, uh, I do delve a little bit into innovations, and I, uh, I'm one of the co-leads in the hospital looking at innovations. And, you know, um, and, and a lot of these innovations that we try to bring in into the hospital, we, I, I tested out in our dermatology patients and, and in our dermatology department. So I'm going to try and introduce you to some of these uh, um, technologies. All right. Okay. So these are my disclosures. Uh, some of these um, farmers have provided funding for projects on some new innovations. Uh, some of these innovations uh, that I'll be describing have not been trialed in the real world, but of course we can dream. And so why do we need digital innovation or technology when we treat uh, atopic dermatitis? I think you know, the last few speakers, the last four speakers have given a very good you know, background on the problems that we face in our patients you know, and really you know, it's a severe case of atopic dermatitis, especially in children that we see. You know, it's really a hard thing for us, you know, to manage the patient, you know, when they have depression, when they have so much, uh, they miss school, you know, and, and parents are so worked up over it. You know, they come in every few weeks to get admitted, you know, for, for treatment, for infections, for flares. And really, I think we really, it's so difficult to manage these patients. And is there a way that we can use technology to really help us, you know, to, to better manage these patients? You know, I always say that, I, I became a dermatologist because, you know, I want to go home early, right? I, that's why I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not a cardiothoracic surgeon, you know. I want to go home on time, you know. But a lot of times when the patients come in and they're so distressed, you know, we, we really have to, 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 to deal with all these in our daily practice. And I'm sure a lot of you all also, you know, deal with it all the time, all right? So, 
Atopic dermatitis, we know, is a chronic and recurrent disease, and they require many visits to, the, um, to us, to the doctors, to the nurses, to our pharmacists as well. And a lot of times, we don't have time to spend with them because in our busy clinic, you know, most of us have about 15, 20 minutes with each patient, and just taking that history alone, you know, takes up so much time that by the time we reach the treatment part, we really don't have that much time to deal with them. All right, so I think, you know, and a lot of times it's, it's a very difficult disease for the patients to deal with because, you know, to monitor it on a daily basis is so difficult. I get patients that come in and, you know, they're flaring and they say, oh, the creams don't work. So I said, did you use your creams uh, in the last two days? They said, no. And, and why? They tell me that, you know, it, it's not flaring, I'm not using it. So, you know, it's so difficult to teach them in a short time how to monitor their disease. So can we use technology to better help them monitor the, the disease? And not only is monitoring difficult, Treatment is difficult as well, and, and you know, there, there are studies that have shown that treating atopic dermatitis, severe atopic dermatitis, can be more difficult than even treating diabetes, right? Because there's so many creams, you know, and, and it, it changes on a daily basis. So really, you know, treatment, monitoring is so difficult in atopic dermatitis. Can we use technology to help us, you know, and our patients better manage it, all right? So, and... Also, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there on social media. Dr. Google, you know, is probably the most consulted doctor in the world. So, you know, can we use technology to help better educate our patients? Okay, so today I'll talk on a few digital innovations that we're doing um, and that's coming on available. And I think we really have to embrace it because, you know, um, it's, it's coming on. And in fact, I think in medicine, we are really quite behind compared to a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of industries. You know, I talked to my wife, uh, about something that I, I that just started, you know, in my hospital, and she goes, she's in the finance industry, and she goes, oh, we did that ten years ago, you know. So we are really, really far behind, you know, compared to a lot of industries. All right, so I'll talk about teledermatology, which we are doing quite a bit now in uh, our hospital, and I'm sure a lot of you are doing it as well. And then link to that, chatbots and mobile applications. Uh, digital sensors and wearables, all of us are, uh, probably half of the room are, are, are using some form of uh, uh, digital sensor, uh, iWatch or something on your hand or Fitbit. All right, so this is a very pervasive uh, in society. I'll talk about augmented and virtual reality as well as uh, metaverse. And, you know, we have, you know, all this technology really has so much, it would generate so much data. What can we do with this data? How can we better use this data to really treat our patients better? And then also I'll talk a little bit on some pet projects that are doing uh, on the smart guidelines that we're trying to develop with the Asian Society of Pediatric Dermatology. And really, I think all this, you know, if we can put everything together, precision medicine for our patients is very out there in a lot of other um, specialties, especially in cancer treatment. Can we do it for our patients with eczema? So telehealth, uh, I'm sure a lot of you all are doing it, and we are doing quite a little bit in, in our hospital. And there are different, we started out um, before COVID, and our pharmacists were doing it for uh, follow-up of, of milder patients. I tried to start uh, for the doctors, but it was very difficult to pick up, and it was only because of COVID, which was really the game changer, and a lot of us... Uh, um, telehealth really picked up in the hospital and in our department as well. So now um, we're doing it mostly for our chronic patients. So um, because in Singapore, I think you felt it already that it's a very high stress society. Um, I always say, you know, in, when I, in the US, in Australia, it's always a distance problem where, you know, it takes two to three hours to get to the hospital for treatment, for, for consultation. But in Singapore, it's tuition. A lot of our children undergo tuition, right? And they're at tuition all the time. They're in school from eight and then they go back at two or three and they have tuition until seven or eight. You know, and I think this is very common in Asian societies and other Asian societies as well. So, you know, telehealth really, really help these patients a lot. You know, in the middle of their tuition, they just turn on the camera and we just do a telehealth, uh, teleconsult with them. So now we are moving on to even doing for new patients. So we get our primary care providers, you know, we, we train them to recognize a topic dermatitis, those milder ones that just need a little bit of reassurance from us, you know, the specialists. Uh, we, we do first visit telehealth. And again, you know, because they really don't have the time to come and see us in our clinic and waiting around the clinic, you know, I think waiting to Zoom is definitely much easier because you can do a lot of other things uh, compared to waiting in the clinic and the other good thing about, you know, waiting at home, I find, is that when, when parents wait in the clinic, they start thinking a lot about questions. <laughs> and the longer they wait, the more questions they have. And then when they come in, they keep on asking questions and they never leave the room. Whereas on Zoom, because they don't, they're, they're still doing something else, right? And before, we, before the consultation, so they don't have that much time thinking about the questions. And so the consultations, I find, is a little bit, you know, uh, shorter. But I think you have to pick your patients properly. Definitely don't pick those patients that are, you know, really 
flaring severe ones. These are the ones that are quite stable and really, um, they, they're just, I have this group of patients that just don't want to go back to primary care. They still want to follow us just for their assurance. So I think these patients are very suitable for telehealth. Um, we also got on to, you know, doing eczema school on telehealth. And we also do, um, and because, you know, in Singapore, we, we, we do help our Asian, Southeast Asian neighbours as well. So, you know, we do quite a bit of uh, tele, um, uh, tele collaboration with our doctors from overseas as well. So what are the benefits of teledermatology? I spoke with some of them, really time, cost savings for patients. There's definitely less risk of infections. Patients and caregivers can be in different locations. So I've got parents who I work, uh, and, and the patient them, themselves are in school or at home, and both zoom in from uh, different sites and then with, with us. So I think that really helps a lot. Um, and of course, multidisciplinary consultations where you can you know, zoom other healthcare providers in, like psychologists or you know, your social workers and all. What are the downsides? I think uh, a lot of times, uh, so far, you know, resolution of videos on device cameras are really not good enough for diagnosing new rashes. So sometimes when they tell, oh, I've got a new rash, then you know, we might have to bring that in. But a tip for everyone I just found out is that you know, your handphone, if you use the front camera, is not as good as the back camera. So if you really want to see a good, have a better resolution, use, ask the patients to switch to the back camera because that helps uh, quite a bit when it comes to looking at rashes on the skin. If, and videos definitely are not as good resolution, so use, uh, ask them to take photos and send them to you because you get better resolution with photographs, all right? Um, and of course, you know, we, I still get comments that uh, from patients who do not want to go on telehealth, really, that they, they want that touch. So a lot of times they really want that touch. But I think it, the, the, the new generation, the, the, the Gen Zs and all, you know, I think a lot of them are so used to technology, you know, that um, we are sadly losing that touch. And, but um, I, I think we have to go with the times, yeah? Um, we do have challenges with IT systems as well, you know, bandwidth and all that. So we do, uh, our, our, unfortunately in our hostel, it can be quite clunky uh, setting up the Zoom. And so if your IT site can help you with that, that will be, that will really take out some of the burden. Uh, I think another exciting thing that we started quite recently is the virtual wards. So we actually manage patients as inpatients at home. And I'm sure a lot of uh, countries are doing it already. Uh, Europe and US, definitely. And we find that uh, these patients... So what we do is that we... Uh, we would teach that when they come to see us, we teach them, we send them home, and every day we Zoom them in. We teach them how to... Uh, apply their creams, we monitor their, their, their skin on a daily basis, and patients really enjoy, and this is one of the uh, um, patients, you know, saying really that um, my daughter just now commented that Kekish at home is the best as she can rest at home and mummy can be the nurse taking care of her with doctor care remotely and a medical team collect blood for her. So, you know, even the patients do appreciate it. So for those of you who really want to try out this uh, virtual wards at home, uh, you can come look for me, I'm, I'm leading it in the hospital, so I can give you some tips on it. Okay, so going on to chatbots, I think a lot of us use a lot of chatbots. It's been around for years. I remember when I was working in the US, I used to chat to chatbot with the uh, uh, Bank of America, and I found it really, really, very, very useful. And they could even understand my Singlish. <laughs> Yeah, so even the chatbot at the time could understand my Singlish. So I was really, really impressed. So now, you know, with uh, increasing adoption of machine learning, AI, you know, really chatbots are, are developing, and I'm sure a lot of your hospitals already have it. So make use of it. Um, and chatbots, you know, there are chatbots, there are type bots, there are avatar bots, you know, really a lot of bots that are there. And you can see, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 information now, you know, that patients actually prefer sometimes talking to chatbots rather than doctors. All right? So I think some of these things can be moved into chatbots and we really can you know, concentrate our efforts on the really more severe patients. Yeah? So if your hostel hasn't come out with a chatbot yet, think about it. It's actually very good. Um, again, this is another paper looking at uh, dermatology uh, using AI chats and you know, a lot of patients actually find uh, some of these chatbots very, very useful. But um, I think if you want to build a chatbot, it has to be very, very useful. There are chatbots that I've gone on that you know, are totally useless and everything will just, it just comes back to, to, to uh, I will call you, you know, kind of thing. So if you do want to build a chatbot, make sure that it is very, very comprehensive. So we have this chatbot in our hospital called UPAL. Um, we've got some of our um, dermatology uh, questions on it. So sometimes we do tell patients, you know, to go there if they have, you know, uh, questions on it. We, we get a lot of questions on like, you know, can my child swim? Can my child use sunscreens? You know, um, how, what foods can they eat? And also these are very standard questions that we get from patients and these basically can be answered by a chatbot. So do think about it. Mobile applications, we got a lot of mobile applications out there. I think sometimes we get fever from mobile applications. Uh, and there are a lot of mobile applications for atopic dermatitis. Uh, we 
came up with one quite a few years ago um, where we got patients to put in their, um, their score on a daily basis, and whether they're good or it was, it was so what we found is the patients, the very few patients actually used it because there was no feedback to them. So all they did was to put you know, the severity of their eczema on that day into the app, but there was no feedback to tell them you know, what should they do and all. So uh, it failed, but um, we are developing um, new bots, uh, sorry, new mobile apps. We did a few studies on looking at uh, mobile applications. This was eczema apps conformance with clinical guidelines. Uh, we found, we reviewed 98 apps and found that 84% uh, of them provided educational information, 39% provided tracking functions, but only 13% of them had uh, educational and tracking functions. Um, and we found that actually none of the apps complied with all criteria for educational information, tracking functions, or health information principles. So really, I think um, you know, the perfect app for eczema is really not out there yet. If anyone has a better app, please come and tell me. I would sure lo love to use it. Um, and then we um, worked with uh, patients, healthcare professionals, as well as digital health experts, you know, to, to do a sort of co-design uh, an app that we feel may be very useful for eczema. Um, and we found that you know, a lot of current eczema mobile apps do not address all the issues for patients and many do not provide feedback. So I think importantly, it must provide feedback to the patient. So he scans it, you know, he puts in his, his severity and then you know, the app tells him, okay, today you, you should use your strong topical steroids or today you don't need to use your strong topical steroids. So there should be some feedback for the patients. Uh, we're working on... Um, a, an app that actually helps us to take history in, in, in our patients. Uh, we call it um, FOJ, or Future Outpatient Journey. It's, uh, it's designed for our whole uh, Sing Health cluster. So what it does is that you know, it takes a lot of questions from the patients. Um, you know, patients are waiting outside, they actually can put into their uh, app and, 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 and provide answers to some of these questions, which are very routine questions like, you know, is there family history? You know, um, is there, uh, do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? Is there someone smoking at home? So a lot of these questions I feel can be, uh, can be you know, are done even before the consultation. So it really, really saves time for in your consultation to really um, concentrate on treatment and managing the patient rather than, you know, taking this history. Uh, okay, just going on, um, the SMART guidelines are a pet project of mine. Uh, I'm working with the Asian Society of Pediatric Dermatology. I think a lot of guidelines now are very static. You know, you meet up, you talk about it, you do a Delphi method, you come up with a guideline, and for the next 10 years, that guideline is there. So, you know, new medications come on, you can't really change it. So what we're doing is that we're doing a real-time web-based guideline, and this is, um, and, and we find that, you know, there are a lot of communities in, in uh, Southeast Asia that don't have pediatric dermatologists. So it's very difficult for them to, to, to know how to treat some of the more severe patients. So it's, um, and, and whether they are general dermatologists, pediatricians, GPs, you know, uh, physician assistants, um, we, they, we, we hope that with this guideline, they can go in, put in, uh, input the data fields of their patient. For example, the age, comorbidity, severity of AD, response to previous treatment, and then the SMART guidelines churns out a set of recommended treatments for the patient for these um, uh, for the for, for for these doctors. So we hope that, uh, and we're going to make it country specific as well. So if that medication is not available in the country, such as the Pilumab, then it won't come out onto the guideline when the, the physicians go in. So um, we hope to get this out by end of this year or early next year. Okay, moving on to digital sensors and wearables. I think you know. A lot of, as I said, you know, a lot of us are probably wearing something now, whether it's a Fitbit, whether it's an iWatch, you know, even your handphone can be a tracker as well. So there's so much information in there that can, we can really uh, help you know, uh, us track our patients. And I think one of the in, in one of the things that is, 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 uh, I, I find is a problem is really tracking that itch. You know, even in studies now, what do we use? We use a lot of subjective scores, you know, NRS scores, which is very subjective. You know, today I'm a five, tomorrow I'm an eight. But really, it's, it's, it's too subjective. So I think there are groups that are trying to look at itch sensors that can better monitor that itch, that can better grade that itch. Uh, this was a group that uh, used a watch to try to monitor the itch and they actually found that you know that movement of scratching with the watch movement actually correlates pretty well with itching so maybe next time in the future when we have uh, studies uh, monitoring for itch and, and um, all these big randomized studies we can give patients a watch and it can monitor their itch uh, this came out from chicago uh, it's a 
wireless sensor that you can stick on the hand and it also monitors itch, also seems to be quite good. We are working with a group from our National University of uh, Singapore looking at the use of a glove to monitor itch. So the patients put it on and then they go about their daily activities and when they scratch, it actually monitors. So I think hopefully um, we're going um, to complete the study soon and we're going to publish that. Um, what's very exciting is actually radar technology. So now you can have this you know, this radar that you can put at your bedside and it actually monitors itch when the patient sleeps. So hopefully we're going to get this project uh, out soon. Uh, I think it's an uh, American and Korean company, Sender Cardian, that we're working with. Okay, moving on to AR or VR. I'm sure all of you all have used some form of AR and VR. Who used to play Pokemon Go? Yes, okay, so <laughs> Pokemon Go is a form of augmented reality where you put uh, virtual images onto the real world. All right, so that's Pokemon Go. And how many of you all have played with VR before, virtual reality? And that's when you transport yourself into another world. It's really cool. All right, so a mixed reality or MR, if you, if you hear about it, it's basically both VR and AR together. All right. So um, I think, and, and now, you know, there's, there's so much more capabilities with AR and VR, like hand tracking. So you can actually, you know, uh, you can actually, um, put a, like a, a cream there and then you can put your hand and you can actually reach out for it and you can feel it as well. So that's quite cool. Um, and that's haptic and sensory feedback. So, you know, touching something, you actually get that sensory feedback when you touch that, that object. So it's, it's really improving a lot. Um, so it's been used in all, you know, a lot of uh, aspects of, uh, of medicine now, like pre-operative conferences, intraoperative navigation, education, consent taking, and... Um, I think it's been used in most surgery as well, you know, to help with, the, uh, with, with patient understanding and reduce the anxiety-related sensations. Um, we've used it for, um, this was a study that we did looking at uh, the use of VR for bedside procedures. So we let patients actually look at, uh, at a VR um, program and they can look around and, you know, really distracts them from doing, uh, when, when we're doing these procedures. Um, but I, I'm very interested in using VR, AR for patient caregiver education. And I think um, 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 the previous uh, talk also talked about this. And, you know, and, and I feel that patient education is so important in atopic dermatitis and treating atopic dermatitis. So, and, and we spend you know, hours you know, trying to educate our patients. Is there a way that we can use technology to better educate them? And I think VR and AR may have a solution to it. So we're exploring with a company now, you know, looking at patient or caregiver education using virtual reality. Uh, this was a paper that came out from Taiwan where it uh, talks about gaming. So the patients uh, shown uh, videos of, um, of and they, they use an apple, apple for eczema, all right, or AD, all right, and they learn how to treat this apple with the atopic dermatitis. You can, they, they, they teach them how to use wet wraps on, this, on the apple, how to uh, put, inject the pillow map on this apple and a few other things that you can do on this apple. And they found that um, when the patients put on the, the MR goggles you know, and they interacted with the apple, you know, a lot of them learned very well you know, uh, education on atopic dermatitis. So you know, really something that is quite exciting in the future. And of course, you know, I think if you all have heard about metaverse, you know, I, I think this is something that's going to come on uh, in the near future watch this space, I'm sure that we're going to develop more things in topic dermatitis on uh, the metaverse. So, you know, we have all this data. So what do we do with all this? I'm sure you've heard about data science, AR, AI, um, machine learning. So data science really is the study of all this big data and, what, and how to make sense out of it. All right. And AI or artificial intelligence is really to enable machines to execute reasoning by replicating this human intelligence and ML or machine or deep learning is a type of AI where the machine learns on its own and really improves from experience. So I think, you know, ChatGPT, I'm sure you have heard about it. A lot of you probably used it as well. I'm, I'm hoping that ChatGPT can write my next paper for me, you know. So <laughs> I was saying I, I don't need my fellows anymore. <laughs> but no, no I, I still, I, I really still need my fellows. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think it's pervasive now in our world and we really, really have to keep up with it, you know, it's, it's going to be in our lives. And if we don't use it, if we don't, you know, evolve with it, we're going to be left behind. So we really have to learn how to use AI in the way we treat our patients, in the way we manage our practice. All right. So um, I'll just tell you about, uh, uh, so it's, it's basically been used for a lot of things, uh, radiology, um, uh, pathology, 
And, and I always say, you know, the three specialties that will go out of business, you know, first, radiologist, second, pathologist, I'm a dermatopathologist, third, dermatologist, so we're third in line. Uh, hopefully, in five years' time, I can retire because of AI. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we've seen it with uh, ophthalmology as well. Uh, cardiology and pulmonology, and of course, um, we are developing AI in dermatology, but mostly um, in, in the field of skin cancers. So, and why AI in dermatology really, you know, because we can get very good pictures. Okay, whether it's digital cameras, whether it's your handphones, you know, you can now, you can take a, you can take a digital photo of a uh, dermoscopy photo and microscopes. Uh, we can see microscopy images as well. So all these images are very good for building AI in dermatology. And I think so far, it's been mostly used in, uh, for, for skin cancers, especially in melanoma field, and they found that the accuracy of these uh, AI can be as good as dermatologists. So really, if we don't evolve, we will be left behind. Um, so that's photographic monitoring of melanocytic lesions. Um, there are also AI looking at dermoscopy or melanocytic lesions, and of course, uh, histopathologic diagnosis of melanocytic lesions as well. But other, other um, applications include chronic wound management, uh, acne grading, we're trying to develop one for that as well, and the LIGO grading has been also been described. However, some limitations, uh, I think the problem is that uh, racial or skin type differences uh, between, of course, the different Fitzpatrick skin types, so you need that baseline skin color, you know, and, and at topic dermatitis, you know, we talked about the different skin colors and really in the darker skin in our Indian population, we really cannot see that erythema very well. So AI needs to learn that as well. So that's one of the issues that we had to um, work around. And of course, image quality, all of us have different phones, you know, uh, all of us have different cameras and lighting is very important as well. So how do we get standardized images, you know, to, to develop AI for eczema? And of course, medical legal implications, you know, if you miss a mycosis fungoides, who is it, you know, who do we sue or who do the patients sue, you know? So there, there are all these which, things which still needs to be worked out. So why AI for atopic dermatitis? And as I said, you know, it's very common getting more chronic and severe, you know, and patients uh, can, it can be very complicated for patients to monitor and treat their atopic dermatitis as well, uh, especially the moderate and severe ones. So we did a pilot study with our uh, computer engineers at uh, ASTAR, and we developed a deep learning model for initially binary classification. So is there eczema or is there not? We took a total of uh, 97 uh, images, and some were of non-lesional skin and some were lesional. We did an uh, easy score for each photo, and then our uh, computer uh, engineers uh, uh, did the data augmentation and train the, the neural network on these images and they managed to come up with an AI that can tell whether there's eczema or not. So if you look at, uh, you, you'll hear of um, terms like ROCs and all that, which actually tells you how accurate the AI is. And we found that even with this small number of uh, images, our accuracy was about 92.5%. So what we're doing now is that we've got a grant to work on a lot more patients, 500 patients. Uh, we're getting 10,000 clinical photographs and we hope that the AI is now able to tell whether the patient has mild, moderate or severe atopic dermatitis. So we're half, we about three quarters done and we hope to come up with the AI algorithm by uh, next year and then hopefully we can build an app that will help patients to monitor the AI topic dermatitis. Um, so I think one of the problems of uh, atopic dermatitis also scoring, you know, when we do studies and all that, patients come in, we do easy scores and, and score at scores and it takes time. So is there a way that we can use some of these photos? We just use our handphone, take a photo of the patient and there's easy score and the score rate comes up immediately. So I think there's some, this study looked at using uh, AI really to come up with um, scoring for our patients. And we hope that our uh, study with all our 10,000 photographs can also help us come up with some form of scoring system you know, for, for studies in the future. Uh, I think the holy grail is really, can we do precision medicine in atopic dermatitis? You know, now, especially we've got more uh, medications coming up with the JAK inhibitors, with the uh, biologics that are coming up, you know, we're targeting IL-13, IL-4, you know, IL-31. Do we know which patient responds which to, to, to best to which medication? So is there a way that we can somehow use AI to come up with precision medicine to better help our patient, help us treat our patients by selecting the correct medicine, uh, medication? So this was a study looking at uh, deep phenotyping of atopic dermatitis. They used a lot of uh, data fields to put in and they found that, you know, um, certain uh, factors may be associated with uh, severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, I've been trying to work with a group from National Skin Centre to you know, draw fluid out from skin to test for um, 
to test for uh, the, the cytokine levels in the skin and hopefully from there, you know, we can better target our patients with the correct uh, biologic. So uh, precision medicine really is the holy grail. So um, hopefully I've done a whirlwind tour of what technologies are out there. Of course, these are the ones that I've had an interest in. There might be a lot more that uh, I haven't gone through, but I think really we really have to keep up with all these technologies. Otherwise, we will be left behind. And you know, all these technologies really improve the way you know, we are practicing medicine, we are, how we are managing our patients. Um, and really, as I said, you know, we really have to, to um, embrace all these new technologies as we move forward. Um, I think the other important thing is how to really, you know, uh, develop that uh, innovation culture and you know in my team there sitting um, those beautiful ladies there I think I've tried to inculcate in them yes hi <laughs> you know really trying to bring on new technologies uh, into the field of dermatology into the field of atopic dermatitis um, I think these are some of the mantras that I go by really think out of the box you know you think of your problems that you have that you face in your patients and from there you know think of how you can solve it and you know you're really not alone work collaborate with your, your other um, specialties, you know, such as engineers, you know, um, we even work with designers and all that, you know, really to come up, uh, IT engineers to come up with solutions for you. So they, these people are out there, they don't know our problems, so you have to collaborate with them, tell them the problems that you face, and then they try to come up with the solutions. Uh, another important thing, don't be afraid to fail. I think out of 100 technologies that come on, probably only one, you know, really goes to market in the end, so don't be afraid to fail. Uh, I, I tend to start small, but I know that people who, you know, really go big from the start, but I like to start small. So, you know, if you had to put in a lot of investment, at least if it fails, you know, you don't lose so much investment in it. So I like to start small. And finally, you know, the world is getting smaller. Talk to people, collaborate, you know, and hopefully, you know, we, all together we can help our patients. All right. So some real last words here from uh, Abraham Lincoln. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Steve Jobs, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. And Bill Gates, I believe innovation is the most powerful force for change in the world. And I just want to tell you about the Asian Society of Pediatric Dermatology. Uh, we have a session tomorrow at 7 o'clock. So if you'd like to come uh, bright and early, go for a run at 6 and come and join us at 7. Uh, uh, the sun rises at about 6.30 in Singapore. <laughs> Beyond 7 o'clock, you can't run because it gets too hot. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we have the RSMPD, this is our regional scientific uh, meeting in, uh, of pediatric dermatology in Delhi. And our ISPD session will be later this afternoon for those of you who would like to come and join us. Um, and we have, after the WCD, we will have the World Congress of Pediatric Dermatology, and this will be uh, on the other side of the, of, the, of the world in Buenos Aires. So do come. Uh, I think registration should be opening after the WCD. And finally, with that, I think I've come to the end of my lecture. Thank you very much and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for that amazing and enlightening talk. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions now. Ask uh, you. You show me a picture. Uh, you mean I mean uh, easy score contains all body area. But uh, I just want to confirm uh, when you take one picture for one special area, or we need to take all uh, pictures for the whole body and have a final uh, score. Okay. So um, for our first project, we were actually not developing the AI to do the easy score. Right? Yeah. We were developing an AI for patients to self-monitor their eczema. So yeah. they take a photo and yeah. the, the, the app, the AI will tell them that you know, this, is a, this is mild. So yeah. today, you only need to use your moisturizer and your quarter strength cream. And um, reduce them to the whole body, right? Okay, no, just on that area. Oh, just, uh, uh, that, that was the aim of our uh, app development. But after getting so many photos, we were thinking, can we then develop it into a way that we can use the photograph to score? Um, and that's more for the healthcare provider when you know, we are monitoring our patients or when they are on certain, med uh, or they are on a trial, you know, where you can just take a photograph and the easy score just comes up. Okay. That would save a lot of time, right? Oh, okay. yeah. I understand. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you for your excellent talk, and thank, thank you for you. hosting us here in Singapore. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in, do you believe, how can you evaluate uh, oozing, you know, when the, the lesion is humid mm. uh, with a photography? Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, so that's kind of where... Thanks, Valerie. Uh, so that's where our, uh, our computer engineers come in. So we've mostly used the scoring that is on, uh, on the easy score, which is erythema, excoriations, edema, and um, lichenification. So we have not added in that portion yet on um, pustulation and, and, and oozing, but hopefully you know, with this set of photographs, we also can do that because we've collected photographs from patients with mild, moderate, and severe, even those that are admitted to the hospital for infections. So our first cut is using the scoring from, from EZ first. Yeah, but I think that definitely can, can be done. I have a question. Um, so, so actually, probably a two-part question here. The first part is, as in some of the talks that we've already realized, you know, eczema is a little bit more than just your easy or your score ad score. How do you take into the perception of the discomfort that the patient might feel that is very subjective and not easily captured by an objective measure like oozing or, or pruritus or even, you know, how many times they itch throughout the night? Sure. So um, I think when we finally built the app, where we incorporate our AI algorithm, we will definitely include other you know, aspects. And, and one of them could be you know, subjective, um, uh, subjective feeling on that day. Um, we're even thinking of putting in other factors like you know, the, the weather, yeah? stress level. If uh, you know, certain times of the year, they are more prone to certain stress like exams. Yeah, so we're still um, thinking of how we want to build that app, but that's a good point. We probably will put in some subjective uh, scores as well. Yeah. And the second part of the question is, do you ever feel like, so I feel like sometimes digital technology is great and that allows you to kind of have point of care monitoring. But for example, the Apple Watch, like you brought up, you know, some people worry about the capability of it doing things like heart rate monitoring and EKG monitoring and things like that, because sometimes it might bring unnecessary concern or heightened, over heightened concern to the patient. So if you're having these apps available at the fingertip, maybe a patient might not feel like they're having an eczema flare, but if the app tells you you're having an eczema flare, do you ever worry about that might kind of compound the problem instead of maybe tracking it effectively? Yeah, that is a very good point. So, I mean, I, I have personal experience of a relative who is so addicted to her monitor that, you know, she, I get a call almost every week to tell me that uh, <laughs> the blood pressure is high <laughs> when it's like 140 over 90. <laughs> so definitely something, I, I, I think as we go along, um, we will learn and um, it's, it's really something that we, we have to learn. But that's a good point, you know, how do we, how do we prevent... Um, and, and I, how do we prevent, you know, overuse of these apps? Um, but I think, you know, it's in, in, in our society now, it's, it's everywhere. It's really everywhere. So I think we have to somehow manage that. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's lunch. <laughs> thank you. If anyone is interested in doing technology, come look for me. Uh, we can try and collaborate. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you all for coming this morning um, to this excellent session. Again, I want to thank all of our speakers, if you don't mind giving them a round of applause for the ones who are still here. <laughs> Hopefully everyone here was able to take away a lot of these non-atopic challenges that a lot of our atopic dermatitis patients face. A lot of them cannot be cured by just topical medications or some of the novel systemics. A lot of them we have to think a lot deeper. So again, I think this was a fantastic organization of different types of speakers and the fantastic lecture topics, especially with the last one that kind of transcended us to the future. Perhaps most of us are going to be out of jobs soon. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, so that is the end of the uh, morning session here. I want to thank you guys all for attending on behalf of the IEC, and hopefully everybody enjoys their stay in Singapore.